Full disclosure, this video was made to explore architecture, one building in particular, and its connection to self-harm. We did our level best to approach this with sensitivity. We focused on positive design solutions and prevention and took expert advice on how to have the discussion. Even with all that, if this kind of video is not a good idea for you right now, skip it. Sit it out. Just say no. no. Resources are below. Let's get started. It's been years in the making, a modern marvel. The vessel. Everybody's excited about the vessel. We had to make a statement. I think this will become the icon for New York for the 21st century. Our idea was just to take the people, all of us, and just lift us up and make something that you would never have experienced anywhere else in the world. But a dark cloud has settled over the giant artwork. This weekend, however, it was the site of tragedy. The vessel, the centerpiece at Hudson Yards, is now temporarily closed. We thought we did everything we would to prevent this. It's really hard to fathom how something could happen like this, and I want to see every possibility that we can do. This is Stephen Ross. Let's call him The Builder. He's a billionaire and the CEO of the real estate firm The Related Companies, which is not a name I would have chosen. But I'm not even a millionaire. What do I know about naming powerful real estate corporations nothing? In 2015, Ross broke ground on a new vision for New York City. By 2024, there would be a 28-acre neighborhood of mixed-use space. Mixed use meaning it has it all. Residences, retail, offices, restaurants, parking. It was to be called Hudson Yards. Most of us understand that in Manhattan, large swaths of empty land begging for development just don't exist. So how do you create space where there is none? Basically, and I had a hard time wrapping my brain around this, Hudson Yards would be situated above active train lines, built over a storage yard for Long Island Railroad trains on Manhattan's far west side. It's a grouping of massive platforms that can support buildings and public spaces, intermixed with skyscrapers and support trusses that extend past the platform down to the ground below, carefully dodging tunnels, utilities, and tracks. Stephen Ross, along with another billionaire and former mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, is that Michael Bloomberg, had conceived of what would be the largest mixed-use private development in U.S. history, with a total price tag of over $25 billion. Now, before you think this place is just going to be bougie as hell, filled with designer shops and wealth, you're correct. With that kind of wealth comes a desire for art and architecture. Phase two, or the Western Yard of Hudson Yards, will include buildings designed by such architecture icons as Santiago Calatrava, the firm Herzog and de Mouron, and Frank Gehry. When asked lightheartedly by the New York Times if he was trying to make a museum of architecture, Ross responded very sincerely by saying, we are creating a museum of architecture and a whole new way of life. This is New York as it should be, with everything you want at your doorstep. The Times reporter did wonder who Ross meant by you. Now, before you think you have to be wealthy to even live in Hudson Yards, you're correct. The Times also called Hudson Yards Manhattan's biggest, newest, slickest, gated community. Renting a one-bedroom apartment starts at approximately $5,000 a month. One bedroom. $5,000. Buying a condo starts at over $3 million, and the penthouse is available to buy for $30 million plus. In a city that's already shockingly expensive to most people, Hudson Yards is regularly described as a billionaire's playground. And the centerpiece to this playground, the jungle gym, as imagined by Tesla, if you will, is a structure called the Vessel. What is this thing? It's been called a beehive, a gaudy bauble, a massive Donner kebab. A friend of mine who's lived in the city for over 15 years agrees with the observation that it looks like a bed bug and finds that pretty representative of the city. 
Massive Donner Kebab is probably not what Stephen Ross had in mind when he contracted Thomas Heatherwick. Let's call him the designer. Heatherwick founded a London-based design studio, known for such things as those spinny chairs that are everywhere now and cost almost $1,000. Heatherwick was commissioned to create what Ross believed would one day be New York City's version of the Eiffel Tower. Like everything else at Hudson Yards, the vessel had a pretty substantial price tag, about $250 million, covered entirely by Ross himself. The design, a series of stairs ascending up 16 levels, was inspired by ancient Indian step wells like Chand Bauri that would bring water to dry regions. It's meant to be tactile and interactive construction that blurs the lines between art, public sculpture, and architecture. Stuart Wood was the chief architect. He served as group leader at the vessel, man on the ground for Heatherwick Studio. Wood said that in building the vessel, their intention was to make a heart to Hudson Yards. Obviously, billionaire real estate guys like Stephen Ross are an easy target. He owns the Miami Dolphins, for heaven's sake. If you prick a billionaire, does he not bleed? But to their credit, it seems the vessel, even if its description was a tad bit pompous to us little guys, was full of good intentions from the wealthy men who built it. Tickets were free. Art for everyone. I wanted to commission something transformational, monumental, Ross told the press. He said, in December, everyone who comes to Manhattan wants to visit the Christmas tree in Rockefeller Center. This will be the equivalent of the Christmas tree 12 months a year. Ross was kind of like a kid at Christmas when he first laid eyes on Heatherwick's plans for the vessel. This is excitement, were Ross's first thoughts. Even when others thought Ross was, quote, nuts, he fought for the vessel, claiming no one has ever given a gift like this. The vessel, along with Hudson Yards, was officially open to the public on March 15, 2019. It was a star-studded ceremony that took place at the foot of the vessel, with speakers like Anderson Cooper, Senator Chuck Schumer, and Big Bird. The vessel's opening was heralded as a triumph of human ingenuity and guts. Big Bird turned to Anderson Cooper and said, How big's the bird that lives in that nest? Then he said, Welcome to the neighborhood! How much did they pay you, Big Bird? The bird can be bought. I'm trying to earn a little extra money, you know? A gospel choir sang from the vessel, Alvin Ailey Dance Theater performed, People were allowed to venture into the vessel. Heatherwick waved from its heights. Overall, the whole opening event screamed achievement, new beginnings, life. There was some criticism. One reporter, Amy Plitt from Curbed, commented that being inside the vessel was a bit unnerving and definitely a little dystopian, with endless flights to climb for seemingly no reason. Despite her criticisms that the vessel was inaccessible and little more than a shiny novelty, she admitted that climbing all the way to the top did leave her feeling odd. And even if the vessel feels empty, it is impressive. The vision for the vessel was complete. Tourists and residents came flooding in. But this is not a channel where we celebrate the latest in billionaires and blue chip art. On February 1st, 2020, a young man leapt to his death from the vessel. From the moment the design of the vessel was unveiled in 2016, critics had raised concerns about the vessel becoming a location for self-harm. But who could say with certainty whether this initial death was just a tragic fluke? After all, Manhattan is almost all tall buildings. But then, two more people died at the vessel. One in December of 2020, and another just a month later, in January 2021. After the third death, the vessel was closed, temporarily, to figure this out. Measures were put into place that would hopefully thwart attempts at self-harm. Access to the vessel, which was previously free, now carried a $10 ticket charge. Visitors could not go in alone, suicide prevention signage was posted, 
and security personnel were employed in hopes of identifying and aiding anyone in a state of mental distress. Five months later, in May of 2021, the vessel was opened again, with the hope that all these measures would make it harder for someone to choose the vessel to end their life. Just two months later, in July of 2021, a 14-year-old boy who was visiting the vessel with his family died. The vessel has been closed to the public ever since. What went so wrong? The ticket prices, the buddy system, the suicide hotline signs, the security personnel, the management holds these up as all good things, solid attempts to prevent harm. But something is missing from that list. If only there were some sort of barrier between a person and open air, like just spitballing here, a railing. Railings, or the lack of them, will form the main question of this video. Are architects and designers responsible for a person's actions? What is their ethical duty through design choices to prevent such things from happening? This was designer Thomas Heatherwick to CBS, right as the vessel opened to the public. I, I suppose we can't predict how people are going to use it. Yeah. It's just is. And then what happens now is, is nothing to do with me. What happens now is nothing to do with me. It's chilling in retrospect. To reinforce the context here, Heatherwick made that comment before the four deaths by suicide. I'm not trying to paint him as a supervillain. I include it only to give you a general sense of how he viewed his role as the designer. Now, the vessel does have railings on all its levels, railings that are approximately waist height. But they're waist height no matter which floor you're on. One reporter remarked how scary it was to be at the top of the vessel and only have that low railing between you and a huge drop. So then why haven't better barriers been installed or even considered? Most of you will be familiar with the issues that the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco has with deaths by suicide. On average, 30 people die here each year, and at least 1,800 have died overall. Charlotta Thedelius is an expert on the importance of location in suicidal situations, and has established herself as a consultant on harm reduction in civil engineering and architecture. Thedelius says that major contributors to making a structure potentially high risk are easy access and low visibility. The Golden Gate Bridge is an example of exactly these principles. Plainly put, it's easy to get on the bridge, and not everyone who jumps is found or even noticed. What's more grim is that suicides have been occurring at the Golden Gate Bridge since it opened in 1937. It was originally planned for the railings to be taller. The potentially apocryphal story here is that the chief engineer, Joseph Strauss, was under 5 feet 5 inches tall, but still wanted to be able to peer over the top of the railings. If the railings had been taller, perhaps some of the deaths could have been prevented. I wrote in my book Smoke Gets in Your Eyes about my time as a crematory operator in the East Bay. There was a week when I cremated two deaths from the Golden Gate Bridge, a 21-year-old man and a 45-year-old man. When I think of those men now, it haunts me that of the small group who have jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge and survived, every single one of them regrets their decision the moment their hands leave the rail. Survivor Kevin Hines called it instant regret. He survived the 220-foot fall, breaking his ankle and two vertebrae. A sea lion helped him stay afloat until help came. That's not like a vision of his, people literally saw it. In fact, to the point of instant regret, a review of 90 different studies found that 9 out of 10 people who survive suicide do not go on to die by suicide later. Despite the almost 2,000 people who have died at the Golden Gate and those who have survived to speak out about suicide prevention, fear of obstructing the beautiful views from the bridge prevails. Back when I lived in San Francisco almost 14 years ago, there was furious talk about a suicide prevention net being constructed at the bridge. It was of such 
obvious importance for prevention that I admit I thought it had already happened. But due to delays, it's still in progress, with an estimated completion date of 2023. These are the same conversations happening around the vessel. Higher railings have always been part of the discussion. One argument against putting up taller barriers is that it would negatively alter the design. But the views, the experience. Stuart Wood, remember he's the chief architect with Heatherwick Studio, stated, we didn't want to design in fear. Hence the lack of precautions built into the vessel. Beyond the views, there's the second argument that barriers just don't work. If the barriers were higher, not only would it ruin the visual experience, those intent on self-harm would just go somewhere else. This same reasoning was used to argue why the Golden Gate Bridge wouldn't benefit from higher railings. This argument is incorrect. Why do barriers work? The Vice President of Research for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention explains that if a person gets to the bridge and there is a barrier, they're not going to shift gears. It's as simple as that. Barriers can make people rethink things, giving them time to move past the moment of crisis. A study published in the British Journal of Psychiatry showed that barriers erected on a suspension bridge in Bristol, a known location for self-harm, cut the number of incidents in half. Some people, especially younger ones, who are living through a traumatic period, might act impulsively when confronted with an opportunity to end their life. But if a barrier gets in their way, more often than not, they won't. This impulsivity can especially be seen in young people ages 15 to 24. The ages of the people who jumped from the vessel, 14, 19, 21, and 24. With all this evidence, you might be asking, doesn't something this tall and built as a public tourist attraction have to have higher railings? I thought the same thing. But it turns out the vessel is coded as an aerial walkway viewing platform. As reported by Curbed, the vessel is similar to amusement park rides, stadiums, and bleachers. So as a freestanding structure, it's art, remember, it's not subject to the same rules as, say, the Empire State Building. The responsibility is largely left to the vessel's creators. Creators who don't seem too into the old railings and barriers idea. Lowell D. Kern, chairman of the community board that includes Hudson Yards, told the New York Times that railings were the one thing proven effective against suicide that they, Ross, Heatherwick, and company, won't do. Said Kern, the only surefire way to prevent this from happening is to raise the height of the barriers. More damning, one of Heatherwick's own frustrated employees stated anonymously, we designed safety barriers for the vessel a while back. It's now time to install. So much has been written about Heatherwick's uncompromising artistic vision for the vessel that when I visited, I was surprised to find the whole thing covered in Christmas lights. Which, I like Christmas lights, but doesn't really scream, this is art that any addition of barriers or nets would destroy. But while the vessel bros haven't explicitly stated, at least publicly, that they won't put up barriers because of aesthetic reasons, they also seem to be dancing around the obvious. Thomas Heatherwick said that improving safety still required further rigorous tests. And Ross's people said that they were exhaustively looking for ways to make the vessel safer. We're just exhausted. I can't imagine what would work? Railings? We've tried so many things already. Railings. There must be something we haven't considered. I just- A railing. Just racking our brains. Put the railings in. Uh, if only there was a way. Just put, just put in the railing. Design and harm prevention don't have to be in conflict. Experts have made the argument that design can be part of the solution. 
Completed in 1973, the Elmer Holmes Bobst Library at NYU was called one of New York's most spectacular architectural experiences by architecture critic Paul Goldberger. But the library has also been marked by tragedy, with the airy 12-story atrium as the scene of three deaths by suicide. In 2003, two students died by suicide in the atrium, causing NYU to put up some plexiglass barricades on the stairways and crosswalks. These barriers were ineffectively designed, and in 2009, another student died. What NYU did next could be a solution for those exhaustively trying to figure out how to make the vessel safer. They erected real barriers that were incorporated into the design of the library. In short, they created beautiful barriers, exactly the type of barriers many have said should have been part of the vessel from the get-go. The firm Joel Sanders Architect was tapped to conceive of barriers that would work with the design of the Bopst Atrium, not against it. Giant gold perforated aluminum sheets were placed around the perimeter of the atrium and around its balconies. The result is the look of, quote, a digital waterfall, or a beautiful piece of lace that's been stretched taut against the balcony slabs. Not only is the plexiglass and aluminum practical and effective at stopping people, but it's artful and integrated into the atrium's design. It makes the experience even better. That may sound a little twee, little unicorns and butterflies to some, but the beauty of a place, the overall positive vibe, is actually a major element of deterring death. The library checks off many of the requirements harm reduction expert Fidelius recommends for public spaces. First, obviously, the barriers. Barriers that are too tall to climb on a whim. Secondly, and maybe less obviously, an environment that remains functional and pleasant. In an interview with Fidelius, it was noted that attractive places with many visitors rarely become hotspots. Ideally, this kind of prevention should be incorporated in the inception of a project, not addressed as an afterthought. Fidelius told the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a bad example would be a bridge with unattractive suicide nets set up. This can easily stigmatize a place and make the general public avoid it. A better example is a bridge with a fence covered in plants and flowers. This doesn't affect a place in the same way. Instead of being perceived as a suicide prevention measure, it can rather be seen as something to simply make the place nicer. This really got me thinking about the mood of a place and the role design plays. I recently read a Frank Lloyd Wright biography and visited the Guggenheim Museum, which he designed. The museum has a tall atrium, but there's never been a death by suicide there. It's possible that's because it's a place that's full of beauty. The gently sloping walkways leading you on a journey to the world's artistic masterpieces. You can't scale its heights without encountering the astonishing creative accomplishments by your fellow man. So what's going on here? Is the Guggenheim life-affirming in a way the vessel is not? The Guggenheim has functionality and purpose. What is the vessel's purpose other than being art for expensive art's sake? The architect's newspaper called it a gilded age gigaw foisted on the city by a benevolent rich guy. And how lucky us huddled masses are to experience it. Thomas Heatherwick and Stephen Ross insisted again and again that the vessel and Hudson Yards were created for all people for everyone to enjoy, a monument to us," said Heatherwick. But putting aside the criticism for the lack of railings and barriers, a primary critique of the vessel and Hudson Yards from the day it was unveiled was that it was only for certain people. In Alan G. Brake's piece, titled Hudson Yards as a Billionaire's Fantasy of the Future of City Life, Brake points out that New York needs spaces that will serve its citizens with equity and dignity, not more antiquated spaces that are for them, not us. 
Brake writes about the collaboration between Ross and Michael Bloomberg, the two men believed, and apparently still believe, that catering to an ultra-luxury consumer magically benefits everyone. Bloomberg famously said in 2013, if we could get every billionaire around the world to move here, it would be a godsend. It's easy enough to say a space is for everyone when everyone around you is just like you. Most obviously, the vessel is an accessibility nightmare. It's all stairs. Any person who lives with mobility issues or, I don't know, uses a stroller can take an elevator to the top levels, but it's not really the experience Heatherwick designed. Heatherwick has described experiencing the vessel as properly using your physicality. And the Architects newspaper nailed it when they stated that Heatherwick defines a citizen subject as one who can walk. A lot. When discussing this video with a friend, he said of Heatherwick's spinning chairs and the vertiginous experience of the vessel, Heatherwick low-key wants to give disenchanted bourgeois cosmopolitans an experience of feeling off-balance, like they're at the edge of death. And what does the feeling of being near death create? A thrill followed by a desire to buy more expensive things, which Hudson Yards certainly has, to further beautify their lives. Their beautiful, thriving lives. Listen, it would be profoundly hypocritical of me to come out resoundingly against bourgeois pursuits. I bought matches the other day that were like $12 and smell like mimosa as they burn. I drink a $6 latte every day of my life. It is my greatest pleasure. People of all income levels desire our little treats, but is it wrong to seek and demand what can best be called an ethical bouginess? It's possible that the Vessel Design team didn't take into account the people who would find themselves at the Vessel, and when confronted by the exclusivity of it all, feel profoundly left out of the conversation as a person and citizen of the city. And without any thoughtful design or protection in place, the worst happened. I don't think Thomas Heatherwick and his team are villains. And I do believe that many involved with the creation of the vessel and Hudson Yards are in fact deeply troubled by what has happened. I also don't believe in censoring art or an artist's vision. Some critics of the vessel think it should be torn down or sunk into the river to make a man-made reef, which I'm gonna say I don't agree with. But to give credit to that opinion, in this case, the art has proven to be dangerous in a mental sense, experiential sense, design sense, and physical sense. Good intentions don't fully inoculate you from that criticism. The right response, and this is simply my opinion, I'd love for this discussion to be continued here, is to humbly learn from what has happened. Remember the dead and learn how to create better for the living. Don't double down on absolutely no railings. You don't understand my vision, mom! And the team throwing up their hands like, we don't know what to do. More tests are needed, how to fix so hard. If you do that, you're effectively saying we care more about the beautiful views and elegant lines of our pleasure bubble than we do human lives. It sounds absurd, because it is. Several months ago, when we first visited the vessel, there was heavy security at the base, making very sure no one came near it. By contrast, the security at our most recent visit was so kind and welcoming. They'll let you into the base, but say that the stairs are closed due to modifications. Now, these aren't the official spokespeople for the vessel, and yes, we contacted them, and no, they won't tell us anything. But when you ask more questions of the people working there, you're told everything from they won't tell us to one man saying confidently nets were going to be installed and soon. One woman told me these were the types of decisions made at conference tables. That is, places where people like her don't have a say.
Before I go, I wanted to thank all of our patrons directly. Videos like this topic don't particularly feel right monetizing, and even if we did, there is no chance YouTube would go for it, and they may very well still ban this video. If you've ever wondered if your $2, $10 Patreon pledge matters, it does. You are allowing us to create these videos.